If I give you all an IQ test right now, and I order the scores from highest to lowest, and then give you another IQ test, completely different from the first one, and rank the scores again from highest to lowest. Well, the high scores in the first test would, will tend to be the high scores on the second test. And unfortunately, that's the case for the low scorers too. So I don't know about you, but I find this shocking and a little bit unpalatable. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most robust and reproduced finding in all of psychology and got me intrigued. The other thing that I know is that both genes and environment influence brain development and can have an, an impact on cognition, cognitability, and IQ. An example for environment is that at the end of summer, children tend to have a, a decrease in their IQ. They've been out of school for two months. Now, I'm gonna give you a metaphor that kind of ties all of these things together. Imagine a circular elastic. It's a brain. And you can stretch this elastic. Some people have an elastic that is easier to stretch than others. And the way to stretch the elastic is with environmental stimulation, intellectual stimulation. IQ does not measure how easy it is to stretch your elastic, which is more something that comes from our genetic background, probably. What IQ measures is the area of the circle, and it can move to some degree as a function of our intellectual stimulation. Keep that in mind, because it's going to give you some perspective on how to understand some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight. So, as part of a um, Ludbury Center scientist, I was granted access to large data sets. One of them is the NIH-funded MRI study of normal brain development. These are children aged from 4 to 22 that came to the NIH every two years, had an IQ test and a brain MRI. The second cohort is the Lothian birth cohort of 1936. So picture this. We're in 1947, and the Scottish government decides to IQ test all 11-year-olds in the country. And the reason they did that is that they thought that their children were getting dumber. <laughs> but it didn't pan out. They were not. Now, the beauty of this data set is that in their 70s, the survivors that were in Edinburgh were retested. And at ages 70, uh, 73, 76, and 79, were, had an MRI. Now, these data sets and others allowed us to find the following. The greater the volume of your brain is, the higher IQ tends to be. The greater the thickness of your cortex is, which is the outer layer of your brain that is crucial for thinking, the greater your IQ tends to be. The greater the quality of your myelin, which is the sheath that surrounds the wiring in your brain, the greater your IQ tends to be. This sheath allows for more um, uh, efficient and fast processing and allow good network efficiency across your brain. Now, these make somewhat independent contributions, and we're getting closer, and there are more findings that I'm not discussing here, but we're getting closer to being able to actually estimate IQ on the basis of a brain scan. And I know this is scary. It scares me, too. Um, <laughs> Now, IQ tends to be stable, but it can change dramatically. And in the NIH, within a two-year period, we've seen children having a, a, an average IQ, and after two years, ending up with an IQ in the top 5% of the population. Um, another interesting finding is that IQ at 11 predicts brain structure 60 years down the road. Six zero. Now, this might give you the impression that things are fixed. They are not necessarily fixed. We can have an impact. So a big question is, how can we increase our chances of maintaining our intellect in old age? So remember, we have IQ at 11, 
We have IQ at 70, 73, 76, 79, and we know what happened in between in terms of life habits. So this is what we found. People that exercise regularly tend to stay sharp in later life or increase their chances of staying sharp later in life. People that get regular medical checkups that could detect diabetes or high blood pressure also tend to increase their chance of remaining sharp later on in life. Eating healthy, Mediterranean type diet, nuts, olive oil, limiting in red meats, uh, also tend to have greater, uh, higher levels of cognitive ability later on. Sleep, people that sleep seven to eight hours a night are those that increase their chance of staying sharp later on. We tend to underestimate the impact of sleep. Don't smoke. We've noticed that the more you smoke, the more your cortex thins. This is somewhat reversible, but it's a very slow process. I had people that had been smoking for 20, 20 years or so, 20, packs, uh, 20 cigarettes a day. It took them roughly 20 years to catch up to the level of their age-matched peers. So it's a slow process. The earlier you stop, the better it is. Take up a new activity, like learning a new language, dance, exercise your brain in general. And something we should not underestimate is social connection. It's really surprising that there's a very strong link between being connected and talking to people, have people close to you, and longevity and maintaining your cognitive health later on in life. So my message to you is, it's never too late to start, but the earlier you do, the better it is. It's a way of life. There you go.